welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. All right, Reed, in today's episode, we are going to introduce the audience to First Lieutenant Haley McLean Hill, and we're going to have a discussion around entrepreneurship, working outside of the Air Force, having a side hustle, that sort of thing. But there's some other stuff that we're going to cover in this episode that is still going to be useful in the Air Force context, right? Absolutely. And, you know, Colin, we shouldn't waste a whole lot of time in this intro. We need to get to this interview, the outstandingness that is Lieutenant McLean Hill. How do you find these people? That's that's just a question I had <laughs> as I was prepping for this interview. We get surrounded by amazing airmen. Yes. Full stop. Incredible interview. Really looking forward to it. Yep. So with that, let's turn it over to First Lieutenant Haley McLean Hill. Okay, we've got First Lieutenant Haley McLean Hill here on the line. Haley, welcome to the Air Force Officer Podcast. How are you doing? Hey, Colin. Thank you so much. I'm doing awesome. Well, I could not be more excited to have you on the show today for a number of reasons. First of all, you've got some unique experiences in the Air Force. You've been a gold bar recruiter, and we're going to hear about that a little bit. Currently a section commander, which... We've talked about previously on the podcast and would love to hear a little bit more about your experience with that. But beyond that, outside of the Air Force, you've done some things that most of us don't really ever even think about doing, much less actually get to do. And I'm not going to spoil any surprises there. I'm going to turn the time over to you to introduce yourself a little bit more and give our audience an understanding of like who you are, where you come from, why you got in the Air Force, and some of these other really unique things that you've been involved with over the course of your career so far. Sure. Awesome. So, hey guys, I'm Haley. I am 26 years old from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. It's like the Poconos area, about an hour okay. outside of New York. Yeah. I grew up in PA and was super involved in dance and just performing, cheerleading. My parents were super big on staying involved. So yeah, perfect lead up to joining the Air Force, right? <laughs> exactly. Get me all ready for all the craziness. So big into school was always a huge nerd. And then, you know, did a little track and basketball. I was on like the bowling team. I don't know. Did all the clubs and all the stuff. President kind of all the things, right? Yes, exactly. And when college started coming around, I was like, all right, what do I want to do? And so my grandmother actually, 20 years Air Force, she retired as a senior master sergeant. Oh, awesome. She was kind of like, Haley, look at this program, this ROTC thing. This looks awesome. Like she was enlisted and she's like, if you want to explore this option, you're only going Air Force and you're only going officer. And I was like, <laughs> okay, sounds like my, my the decision is there already. So I kind of looked into it and I applied and I received the type two scholarship. So uh -huh. I'm not yep. sure. Yep. Type two. So any in-state school, I was actually really trying to get out of state, going down to Florida, maybe Miami or something. Yeah. But it was just going to be too expensive. So I went to Penn State and I fell in love. So I was like, you know what? This is not going to be awful. Let me go here and got my entire school paid for, which was incredible. And again, just having my grandmother, who's kind of been through the whole process, she kind of walked me through you know, the journey of learning the whole thing also like, okay, you know, putting real life to what I've been learning ROTC. So yeah. that was awesome. I came in as a chemistry major okay. because at the time it was like, you either have to have a STEM degree or not and totally failed all my physics classes, like just awful, zero percents on exams. I'm like, I, just, <laughs> I don't think this way. And it's, it'll all kind of tie into what I do now, I guess, because I do sure. the complete opposite of physics now, which is awesome. So I went into my cadre and I was like, I can't do this. They're like, all right, you can be an engineer or you can get into math. And I was like, mm, math uh, sounds cool. My mom was a math major. She worked at NASA for a little while. So 
I was like, I think it's in my blood. I think I can do it. I think I can do it. And so I worked my little butt off and got my degree in math on the side. When I was not in ROTC as a cadet, I was a cheerleader for Penn State. So awesome. Yeah. Football, basketball, men's and women's, everything. We did volleyball, hockey. It was incredible. I went to the Rose Bowl. I mean, just the most incredible experiences. I think, wow. Yeah. At the Rose Bowl, I met the, it was a lieutenant general. He was like second in command. He was like the vice, something to the vice chief of staff or something. And I was in my cheerleading uniform and I saw the stars just walking around the field. And I was like, oh my gosh, nobody knew who they were. <laughs> of course, they're like walking around them. I'm like, figuring out if I should be saluting or not. Like, I'm like, oh my God, still a With palms in your hand, how do I salute? <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh my gosh. And my coach was like, go up and say hi to him. So I went up there and, you know, they were like, oh, okay, hi, nice to meet you. They found out I was a cadet and they coined me and I was like, this is the best day ever. I saw the the B2. It was just like such an Air Force fun day. And I, thought, I was just like, I'm so proud. And at that point, I was just thankful that cheer and Air Force kind of always went kind of hand in hand with everything that I learned from being on a team and then from being, you know, on the Air Force team, pretty much. It's just helped me so much be a positive influence and as a leader to kind of understand the dynamics of all of it. So it's been really cool. Wow. Can I pause you there? Because you dropped some huge (laughs) nuggets that I just want to make sure that we address. So very early on, you were involved in all kinds of different things. You did dance, you did bowling, you were involved in your school. And along the way, as you're considering what you wanted to do for a career, you had these mentors. Thankfully, they were like nuclear family, your mom and your grandma. How awesome is that to be able to point you in the direction of the Air Force and give you this idea of a career path maybe that you hadn't even considered? I mean, how awesome to have a senior master sergeant for your grandma. (laughs) I know. I know. And I never really looked at her that way because she retired when I was super young. So I never experienced that. But my mom traveled the world with her. They lived in Hawaii and England and all over. Mm -hmm. And I've heard the most incredible stories. And in high school, my mom, they gave me like, it was like my birthday gift to do a European adventure. It was called um, People to People Student Ambassadors. Yeah. It was an opportunity to go travel Europe for about three weeks and it kind of gave me the taste of travel. So from the stories and from that, I was like, oh, I'm sold on the Air Force. Like, let's do it. So. Yeah. <laughs> and then your mom working at NASA, was she a mathematician there? She was an accountant. So Okay. Because kind of, I almost was going to be like, is this like a hidden figures part two sort of thing, you know? <laughs> For real. I know. No, she's like, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. I just dealt with some of the money things and whatever. Oh, I'm like, yeah, just some of the money. <laughs> I know. I'm like, mom, you worked at NASA. I'm like, you're legit, man. Like, you're so legit. So, yeah, I mean, she actually became a stay-at-home mom. Like, when... So she worked for NASA and then my sister was born. We're seven years apart. So once my sister was born, she became a full-time stay-at-home mom. But, you know, still total badass. So Yeah, so awesome to have these mentors to guide you along the way and have them so close to you. I mean, obviously, not everybody's going to have their parent or their grandparent as the direct mentor for them. But it shows the importance and the value of having a mentor, especially from the early years helping to answer some of these questions and give you guidance in the direction that you can go. Absolutely. I mean, from when I was a child, I mean, it's always been at the forefront, you know, studies is absolutely number one and just setting yourself up for success. Like it was constantly like, okay, what are we going to get you involved in? That's going to add to your resume per se, to make you a valid candidate for college and just in general, being a well-rounded human. So it Mm -hmm. wasn't just like, you're only going to be a dancer. It was like, okay, no, you're also going to be in student government. You're also going to play an instrument. You're also going to do these types of things. So it's like very whole airman concept from the beginning, you know? Yeah, right. But at the same time, allowing you to pursue the things that were interesting to you, but also guiding those interests in the direction where you can truly find success. That is the mark of a true mentor, someone that will identify what is good and unique and powerful within you, but provide those guidelines, those rails that help you steer in the direction of success. Exactly. And it's also like seeing your strengths. And my mom is super good at seeing my strengths. And she says me and my sister, I mean, we're completely different. So my sister was like a tennis player. It's funny. I mean, hand-eye coordination isn't really my thing. It's more of like the full body stuff, you know? So cheerleading, gymnastics, track. I was like a jumper, you know, stuff like that. So Cool. Yeah. 
All right. Well, we've covered your upbringing. You did ROTC. You got through the program. While you were going through that, did you know what you wanted to do for the Air Force? Had you picked out a career field that you knew that was the thing that you wanted to do? Or were you more open and flexible to, you know, say the needs of the Air Force? You know, um, I actually didn't really know coming in. My grandma, again, kind of was like, you know, she was in the dental field. So I knew I wasn't going to go in that direction. And I knew I didn't want to fly. I knew I didn't want to fly. I was like, no, that's just probably not for me. My friends who were pilots were just so high speed. I was like, yeah, y'all are, y'all got this. Y'all definitely got this. Um, but I went to an air show in Maryland, I'm pretty sure. And I met the Thunderbirds PAO, public affairs okay. officer. And she was so cool and just a total rock star. I was actually in a sorority in college. She was in the same sorority. And it was just like, Perfect. And she was like, you should totally do public affairs. And I was sold on public affairs. So I put that as my number one. And I got four support. They were like, okay. you'd be a good personalist. And because of my technical degree, they're like, you know, PA is just too non-technical for you. We want somebody who's kind of in that broadcasting or something like that. So yeah. it made complete sense. And honestly, I look back and I think it's such a great decision by the Air Force. So I love it. I love this position. I can do so many oh, good. things. Yeah. I mean, sometimes the Air Force gets it right. You know, we think we know what we want, but the Air Force, you know, through sheer force of numbers, because they've been through this so many times. And also just because that's where they needed you. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, it very could have ended up that, you know, you ended up in like aircraft maintenance and you hated it. <laughs> well, I right? did end up there, but as a section commander. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, so let's pull on that thread then. So. The Air Force gives you force support. Mm -hmm. You go on active duty. When did you enter active duty? When did you graduate and all that? May 2018. Okay. So it's been just a little over three years now since you entered active duty. You came in as a force support officer. You went through the normal training pipeline. Walk us through what happened from there. Wasn't there a time that you did gold bar recruiting as well? Right. Yeah. So when I was about to commission, they always put out special duty assignments, just like in the Air Force uh, and active duty. So I saw this when I was like, you can be in a city, you know, you're not on a base. You get to just talk to kids all day and really inspire them to join the Air Force. I was like, yes, this is me all the way. Like cheerleader 101. Like, yeah, girl. right. <laughs> I'm like, this is so fun. So I applied and I got it. And I actually wanted, again, try to get down to Florida, wanted to be in Miami. I like warm weather. And, you know, Miami is a good time. So I was like, I would love to go down there. They're like, well, as a recruiter, you're going to need to be bilingual because of the dynamics down there. So I was like, okay. Sure. And I've taken like five, six years of Spanish. I was like, I could, but then my second was Atlanta. And because I'm a black young female, they're like, this would be so good for you and for us. So I was like, you know what? That's such a great decision. Again, the Air Force was like, no, this is what you should do. And I was like, yeah, we were totally right. So my best friend that I actually trained, field training, I was his CTA, actually. I don't know if you know that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I was a CTA and he actually got Miami and he was perfect for that position. I was perfect, okay. perfect for Atlanta. So yeah. It was awesome. Okay. So let, let me just make sure that I understand this, that the audience understands what happened here. So as you were getting to the end of your time in ROTC, you weren't on active duty yet, right? Correct. That's when you heard about this opportunity to be a gold bar recruiter. You applied, got accepted. The Air Force gave you the option of a couple of different cities. Your first pick was Miami, Florida, but you also had Atlanta on there. And so the Air Force matched you to Atlanta. Is that all correct? Correct. Spot on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then like you said, they matched you to Atlanta. You said, because you're a young black female, walk me through that a little bit more because obviously there's some racial dynamics in that, like in the dance and theater world, we call that typecasting, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I want to hear it from your perspective. What was that like? What went through your mind? You say that it ended up being a good thing, but just I want to hear how that all worked out for you. Sure. So in general, recruiters are not usually officers. So there's that. And Correct. Air Force, too, is pretty rare seeing an Air Force recruiter out there. And then being a minority is just very rare and a female you know, it's just very rare. You know, I don't know the exact statistics, but like here at Beale, um, which is where I'm stationed, I know, I met a couple actually, but five minority female officers. Yeah. And again, it's just, we're a very small population. So I believe that, and I think it's 
just like you were saying, like having people around you to mentor you is just so important. And the fact that they look like you and are can relate yeah. to you is huge. It's just massive. And um, in Atlanta and in Georgia in general, and like I covered Georgia and a little bit of Alabama, uh-huh. you know, there's a lot of black people down there. And so a lot of young black Americans who are just like kind of feeling like, what am I going to do? Like they're either like, you know, I know a lot of the kids that I talk to, they're like, yeah, I don't really know. Or like, I'm going to pick up rapping or I'm going to pick up, you know, like, you know, I'm really good with football. And I'm like, okay, like these are phenomenal options, but like, let's talk about the other things that you're really strong at. You're phenomenal in, you know, STEM or you're really good with, you know, talking to people, just showing them the different options is just so monumental for them. Right. And I really believe that, me going down there and me walking in, first of all, as an officer, and then as a black female officer, they're looking at me, they're like, who, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I'm Lieutenant McLean Hill. And they're like, oh my gosh. And they just wanted to know so much more. And I've right. still held on to those relationships. Like I do Zoom calls with the colleges and high schools all the time and like the JROTC detachments and stuff like that. So it's just about building relationships and showing them how important it is to venture out into different paths that are kind of like not typical, but it's totally fine and you'll be great at it, you know? Yeah. And see, that's the thing is like, so we say that the Air Force isn't for everybody. When we say that, we mean like, it doesn't matter what your background is, where you come from. Like anybody can come into the Air Force so long as they meet the basic requirements. But the things that we have to go through, the lifestyle is not necessarily for everyone. Correct. But the Air Force historically has had a huge problem of reaching the minority demographic, especially young women, especially people of ethnic or racial backgrounds. And guys like me, you know, I'm the quintessential Air Force demographic. I am white. I am male. I am Christian. Like you're six. Those, no. <laughs> like I was a shoe in essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. Because Everywhere I go in the Air Force, I see people that look and talk and think like me. Mm -hmm. And that makes it really hard for me to connect to the rising generation that doesn't look, talk, think like me. And so we need people like you who are every bit as capable and just crushing it in the Air Force to go and reach that demographic that I can't. I mean, I can connect with people of different genders, different races, different backgrounds. Of course. But that first initial impression, getting through the door, climbing over that wall, if you will, there's a barrier to entry there that you are able to much more easily navigate than I could. Exactly. I mean, I talk to my airmen all the time and a couple of them told me the other day, they're like, they're telling me about their first impression of me coming in here. So I just left the maintenance squadron and now I'm back at, at FSS and I'm working at the fitness center. It's so funny. Like they're like, first day you walked in, we we're like, you're an LT or they're like, <laughs> you know, like just like just those types of things. And I'm like, and we have such great open conversations that I can relate up the chain or like talk to them about, hey, this is what leadership is really trying to say and communicate to them in the way that they really understand and like be like, okay, like, yes, got it. And it's just being human. You know what I mean? Sometimes like yeah. they see me and they, and that's the other thing. I'm, you know, I'm mixed race. So I'm, I'm black and Irish and like, I've kind of grown up around both my entire life. And that gives me the opportunity to be very transparent and just being kind of like that person who can kind of get all sides. So it's, um, it's not a bad thing. You know, it's not a bad thing that sometimes you can't relate to somebody, but it is so great to kind of have that opportunity to be like, all right, I think she's going to kind of understand where I'm coming from here. And I can be like, you know, this is really what it is. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, just fantastic that you, one, are in the Air Force at all. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you to your mentors for showing you that path. And then two, that you took the time to kind of give back and be that mentor to others, that you saw the opportunity within the Gold Bar recruiting assignment, that you took that opportunity to connect with people who don't even know what they don't know, right? Exactly. And show them that this is a possibility. And thank you for your willingness to be open and honest about what the experience was. And really, that's where this needs to be. And we'll move on to some other topics here. But just the takeaway for you and me and for the audience here is just be willing to talk. Like, 
yes, there are barriers to entry, barriers to these kinds of conversations. But if you are willing to open your mouth, if you're willing to then shut your mouth and listen, <laughs> if, you, if you're willing to engage in an honest dialogue with somebody who doesn't look, talk or think like you, then that's where really magic is going to happen. That's where innovation and creativity and it happens at the borders, at the intersections. That's where the true magic is going to happen. 100%. And you can A, learn something from anybody that you come across. Everybody that I meet, I look at them. I'm like, what are you going to teach me today? Like, that's mm -hmm. how you got to look at it. And then also it's like, not being afraid to take that risk to get out there and put yourself out there in situations that might be a little uncomfortable or different for you. Cool. All right. So let's spend a minute here on what you're doing now. You say that you were a section commander with the maintenance squadron. Give us, you know, the quick spiel on what that was like. You know, maintenance is its own animal within the Air Force, right? <laughs> Oh, gosh, just picture this little cheerleader, right? Just walking into a <laughs> den of wolves, you know? They like, I mean, it was so funny when they told me I was going there. I was like, oh, fun, perfect. I walked in first day. I was like, hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? You know, super happy and positive. I'm not saying they crushed my soul. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just completely different from like for support and from recruiting. Like it is just yeah. from my background and from what I've experienced, it was just completely different people. But I've met the most just dedicated, passionate people who are just all about completing the mission and getting it done, like no matter what. I mean, they're so amazing. It's not like they don't nitpick things. They're not like, oh, like, you know, or your hair or whatever, because it's like, they're focused on such big picture things and like saving lives and like really getting the job done. All the little things doesn't really matter, which I love that about it because at the end of the day, we're all here to get the job done. And it's like, if we can come in and just feel like just such a, I mean, I just feel like such a part of the team every day, you know, going to the flight line, it was just like, I was a, really a part of something. And I think that's what they really wanted to do with the new LTs coming to Beale. They're like, we want to put you in these squadrons to, so you can understand the mission. And I think a lot of people get that when they like deploy or something like that also, but like being right next to the planes, like my office was in a hangar. So it was just like constantly seeing the air power and the pilots and the maintenance officers enlisted everybody. The dynamic of it is so powerful. I was just like, wow, like this is not a joke. But again, I get what's coming in a first lieutenant because I had done a year recruiting. And then yeah. as soon as I got there, I was there for like a couple, I was here at Beale for a couple months and then I pinned on first lieutenant. So that's kind of the timeline. And um, they were looking at me like, LT, like, why don't you know how to do these basic, you know, personnel things for us and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I just went to tech school. I'm like, I'm still learning this. And then section yeah. commanding is so new. There's not really a rule book for it. And me with my personality of just like, you know, oh, this is, we're just gonna have fun and I hope everyone's great. No, it, <laughs> it, it just, it just, it didn't work. And let's just say a couple of the maintenance chiefs, you know, had some fun with me, getting me in check. So I learned so much. I got a tough skin from them. And um, I mean, I was second in command to a 300 person squadron. So like that was huge difference from literally just being responsible for myself, which I think taught me so much about caring for my people and trying to, you know, find the balance between getting the mission done and making sure that they're good to go. I think for me, they taught me so much, but I also taught them about still having fun while they were, yeah. you know, getting it done. It lightened the mood a little bit. So now I'm over here back at fitness and, you know, they're nitpicking me about my hair and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> stop it. I'm like, we don't have to worry about that right now. I'm like, we can worry about what's, you know, the mission and what's going on. And it's just everywhere you go in the military, and especially with force support, we're called, you know, we're cradle to grave. So I could literally end up working in mortuary or I can end up working at the CDC. I can be working at um, the DFAC, all these types of things. I'm thankful I'm in the fitness center because I love to work out and I love to be in this type of environment. Again, wherever you get placed, you just have to kind of, you grow, you learn, it's growing pains, but then you figure out, like, it's just so beautiful how it all works together. Yeah, I love how you brought in the role of the NCOs, the senior NCOs there in the maintenance squadron, taking the young lieutenant under their wing and for lack of a better word, they squared you away, right? They told you what's what. <laughs> And I love that they, they took that responsibility seriously and that kind of like what we were saying earlier, you were open to the dialogue, you were open to the correction and the instruction, and you came out all the better for it, right? 
Absolutely. And it's cool too, because I had male and female chiefs and I've had male and female, you know, master sergeant, senior master, all of those. And so each one, and I'm not going to say like, I preferred getting yelled at by like my female chief or something like that, you know, (laughs) it wasn't anything like that, but it's really cool to see how both handle their situations. And then to be able to, it was nice. I had one master sergeant, her name was Amy and she was amazing. We're still close. She PCS to Florida, but she still will look after me and be like, okay, LT, you know, are you learning this? This is what you need to be on top of all this stuff. And it's just like that motherly feeling because you're away from family. And also like life happens. It's not just the Air Force. So it's like you have someone there who's going to be like, I understand. And this is how you handle it with, it's just finding the balance with it. Cause it's just, it's a lot sometimes. It's a lot. So it yeah. helps me personally and professionally. Yeah, for sure. And also as a section commander, you are considered part of the command team for the squadron. So I'm curious, what was that dynamic like having that close relationship with the squadron commander, the senior enlisted leader for the squadron, the first sergeant, kind of walk us through what was that like too? Yeah, absolutely. I was literally able to walk into my commander's office and I had um, a major, I had two majors and it was just like, hey, if you need anything, just text me type of vibe. It was just like, you're my second command. I had I was on G series orders. So anything that he or she didn't want to sign, I signed it. I was mm-hmm. approving leave. I was doing some disciplinary action things when he was on leave. I um, dealt with some really interesting situations. Yeah. I was yep. like, whoa, this is especially in maintenance. Oh, <laughs> maintenance. Gotta love them. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, this is really spicy over here. I was like, okay. <laughs> no wonder you can't answer all your emails because you're busy, busy, you know? So it was really interesting. <laughs> It was interesting to see like the FGO type of that relationship right there. And then dealing with the first sergeant and again with the chiefs and usually LTs and maintenance are kind of like, you know, like, eh, oh, LT, you know what I mean? Because we're still learning and everything, but they all really just kind of held me here. They're like, okay, we get that you haven't had a lot of experience in general. So we're just going to really absolutely set the standard and hold you accountable. But at the same time, we're going to understand that you're learning. So I absolutely loved it. And I think it allowed me also to understand that I needed to really learn how to set boundaries and like, Mm -hmm. you know, not just play the little LT card all the time. You know what I mean? It was like, okay, I'm actually calling the shots sometimes and I need you guys to respect that. And I need us to have that relationship. So that was interesting too, because I think I got kind of close with a couple people that I realized I was like, oh, there's no boundary there now. So it's really hard sometimes. And I'm a very open and honest person, but you can still be that way. But you just have to make sure when the time comes, you have to be the one to be like, I'm making the decision. This is what it is, like it or not. But over here now, fitness, I'm like in a flight now. I'm not at that level. And right. so now that I can't just go walk to the commander or I have to like, I'm like, what? I'm like, use the chain of command and all that. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, this is complicated. I'm like, I just need to ask him a question. <laughs> so it's again, just all learning process. Yeah, such an interesting thing. You said that sometimes, even as a lieutenant, you are in a position where you have to call the shot. And that is something that I don't think we, as an institution, especially in our commissioning sources, do a good job of really communicating and training for, is that once a commission officer, you hold the exact same authority you know, from the President of the United States and the Constitution right. as any other officer of any other rank. Should the situation call for it, you absolutely have the responsibility to make that decision to call that shot and do so effectively for the benefit of not just the Air Force, but the person that you are trying to correct, rehabilitate, direct in the right direction. And you got to be prepared for that. When the pitch comes your way, you got to be ready to swing. Oh, yeah. And you have to know that people are expecting that from you, like your airmen, your civilians. Like I had to I was in charge of like four civilians who are all like 65 years old, but they're like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but they're like looking at me to like when we have staff meetings and stuff, it's like, I can't just come in and be like, Hey guys, what's going on? Like, they want me to come in with a plan. They want me to know what we're doing. They want me to understand, like, you know, if someone's having an issue with somebody else, how to handle that. Like, and I'm like, aren't you guys like, 10 times my age shouldn't even be able to handle this. <laughs> but they're, you know, they're, they're looking at me to make those decisions. So yeah. it's like, it's not a fake it till you make it, but it's just kind of like, 
I don't know. I honestly think it's like an experience thing, honestly, especially in RTC, you're around your peers so often. When you're in active duty, you're really not. So it's like, yeah. it's hard to simulate that in that type of environment. But, you know, I did try with being like a CTA. I got the opportunity to work hand in hand with officers and like see how they handle things. And like, I think the biggest advice I can give to RTC kids, like to be prepared for that is to like, number one, take those leadership positions, of course, and just put yourself yep. in them then. Get it out of the way. Get the uncomfortableness out of the way. But then also, like, I don't know, get a real job in the real world for a little while, too, and see what it's like. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Dealing with people. (laughs) For real. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So therein is a fantastic opportunity for us to transition to the real meat and potatoes of why we're here today. Yes, We wanted to talk about your Air Force experience as short as it may be, no offense, you know, you're uh, still a young lieutenant, but look at what the ground that we covered. There's some really fantastic lessons from your time getting into the Air Force, Gold Bar, being a section commander that, you know, even the colonel with 25 years in service can learn something there. But really the reason why we're here is to talk about the things that you have been involved with outside of the Air Force. Now, I left that little nugget there at the beginning of the show. I didn't want to give away the surprise. Haley, if you wouldn't mind, tell the audience a little bit about what you've been doing outside of your active duty service. Absolutely. When I was in Atlanta, I was recruiting, but I also was a NFL cheerleader for the Atlanta Falcons. What? (laughs) Yes. Okay. (laughs) Air Force officer. On active duty, yes, full time job and commitment, yes, you know to that. Mm-hmm. We're also an NFL cheerleader, yes. <laughs> there goes my head. Okay, <laughs> you're gonna have to explain all this. I will gladly. So a lot of people have no idea what the pro cheer world looks like. They look at the cheerleaders, they're like they're beautiful, and they must be getting paid millions, just like the players. <laughs> and you know, oh, you know, gosh. All of the things that come with it that are not very great, like not very nice. Usually it's just people are just not, it's just something a lot of people don't think about. So sure. Because why would they? Yeah. The combination of Air Force officer and NFL cheerleader, just, you know, those things don't mix. Right. 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 You just don't ever hear about that. Kind of like what we were saying before. People don't know what they don't know. Exactly. And I kind of got that, as soon, like even in ROTC, when I was a collegiate cheerleader and a cadet, a lot of the cadets didn't do things outside of ROTC because that was their thing. And I was like, yeah. like I told you from when I was a young girl, it was like, you are going to be involved and you're going to be well-rounded. And I didn't want to give up my passion. I absolutely loved to perform. I absolutely loved being a part of my school, being a part and just that spirit of it. I had to keep going. So when I graduated and I knew I was going to Atlanta. I was actually recruited by the Miami Dolphins cheerleading team. But again, I know we keep bringing up Miami, but you can get recruited to cheer in the NFL, actually. And okay. again, once I knew I wasn't going there, I was like, okay, I'll just go for Atlanta. And the incredible thing with NFL cheerleading is they expect you to have another job on the side, actually. So it's an expectation because we do not get paid millions like the players. <laughs> we do not. And you know what? That's kind of showbiz. That's the entertainment world. And that's just kind of what it is right now. And actually, that's a little passion project of mine to kind of show the world exactly how incredible these women are that you think are just hot shaking around, but they're so well-rounded. When I was training on the Falcons, I was the only Air Force officer, obviously, but there was a girl who went to the Olympics for track. There was a girl who was a neuroscientist. There was girls who were like high up VPs in Coca-Cola because Coca-Cola is like down there. And I mean, just like the most amazing girls getting their doctorates, everything. It's expected of you to be wow women because you have to be able to dance. You have to be at that level where you are competitive When you're trying out for a professional team, there's about 300 to 400 girls trying out for positions that usually there's only about four or five opening, but there's 32 to like 26 to 32 girls on the team. Okay, cool. Usually there's going to be vets and rookies coming back. And that's why I say there's usually only like five positions open Uh because they usually take the vets back. But if girls are leaving, they're going to be like, all right, we have space. So for me, it was a really great year. And again, it's just kind of like the Air Force a little bit in the sense where like, you know how there's jobs and there's openings. So like PA, like might have one opening that year, but the next year they have like 25. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, you missed a good year. It's just what it is. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. Exactly. Same thing with NFL cheerleading. And um, 
yeah, that year we had the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. A couple girls had already cheered in it before. And so they're like, all right, it's good. So I had a great opportunity. There were 10 slots open. So made the team and it was just the most, I mean, incredible. I mean, I did cheer at Penn State, which was 100,000 plus fans every game, but there's something different about cheering at the professional level that I'm just very proud of myself to be able to call myself a professional at this point. Right, for <laughs> so, sure. Yeah, it was it was amazing. We even got to go to Hong Kong and cheer in the Chinese New Year Parade. So we got kind of the whole tour of Hong Kong and everything for a week, and it was amazing. So Super Bowl was there that year, too. We weren't in it, but got to do some Super Bowl appearances. So it was pretty cool. So while you're on active duty, you're working full-time during the day. Correct. Then I'm guessing, I'm assuming that cheerleading then is not a full-time job, obviously. There's the expectation that you're doing something else. What is the schedule like and how are you handling all of the work that you're doing for the Air Force, the rehearsals, the practice, the games? How are you doing all of this? Right. You know, they do try to help us and they do understand. So that's one thing that we're very thankful for. But we practice two times a week for three hours from like 6.30 to 9.30 and then games on Sundays and then occasional Mondays. So it's really not that grueling. And because we're all professionals, we come in, we knock out the choreography mm -hmm. and like we're expected to know what we're doing before we get in. So it's like, hey, you're professionals, get it done. And then we perform at the game. So it's really not that crazy. A lot of people don't think it is. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's something that I'll be ever <laughs> able to do, but you know, apparently this is a possibility and maybe there's someone out there in the audience that's thinking, Hey, I'm a cheerleader. I've got a background in cheerleading. I'm, I want to, maybe I can do this. Yes. So that's really cool. Yes. But you mentioned that in this group of cheerleaders, there's all these, what you called wow women. I love that term Yeah. <laughs> of people doing a lots of other things and going back to the theme of mentorship right? Was there opportunity for you to really get to know them, to learn from them, to hear their experiences, maybe consider some other opportunities? 100%. I mean, it's literally a big networking ball of like just incredible girls around you that are here to uplift you at all times. I mean, I got to go to a bunch of I mean, they're just so well connected to a lot of them are from the Atlanta area too. I'm one of the outsiders because I'm in the military. So they all just it's like going to a city and knowing everyone who's important all at once. <laughs> really, that's really what it was. And so the cool thing is when I moved out here to California, I missed that feeling and then COVID hit. And so they weren't really doing yeah. cheerleading and all that stuff. So it was kind of like, dang, like, am I done? Like, am I going to hang up the palms? I don't know. And then this year I saw that the 49ers were doing their tryouts. So I went for it. And again, I've never been to California. So I was like, how perfect of an opportunity for me to just go and know everyone who's important again, like in a city. Yeah. And so I'm like, Hey, it's such a great way to network. Okay, so are you cheering again then? Are you with the 49ers? I am with the 49ers, yes. Wow, okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you didn't hang up the palms. You are back in that network, connecting with all these really, these wow women again. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That's so awesome. <laughs> it's so great, yeah. It's my second time being a rookie. So it's like I'm experienced and the girls look at me like a rookie, but they know I've been on a team before. So they're like, they can't mess with me too much. <laughs> <laughs> Not like the senior NCOs and maintenance, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay, so you're a cheerleader outside of active duty. And I want to use that to kind of get to this bigger, broader idea of having a side hustle, of doing something more than just what you do for the Air Force, taking what you learn in the Air Force and applying it outside and or taking what you do on the outside and bringing that back into the Air Force. So I have this thought in my mind, and I'd love to have this discussion with you, that I think that every Air Force officer should have a side hustle for a number of reasons. But before I share mine, I want to get your take on that. What is your thought on, you had a side hustle of cheerleading, but I think you also have something else going on now, right? A business that you're trying to create? Yes, I do. So give me a, your thoughts on this idea of every officer having a side hustle and what your experience has been with that. Definitely. Yeah, Colin, honestly, every Air Force officer I've ever met is so amazing in so many different ways. Their organization skills, the way that they problem solve, their strengths, like they're usually incredible with tech. And I mean, everything that they do, they know how to do it so well. I'm like, why not use those skills on the outside as well? Like, it's tough. It's tough because 
it is such a demanding job and I totally understand that. But at the same time, like flexing, maybe like that creative thing that you like to do on the side or something like that, giving you that kind of outlet is just so, it's so fun. It's just fun. It keeps everything very fun and light. So I did start a clothing brand. It's called Torch. Love the name, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. It's because I'm a fire sign. So, you know. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) And um, it's specifically to help military women feel more comfortable in their uniforms. So again, as a cheerleader and somebody who is big into fashion and just kind of that double world, I wanted to kind of mesh them together and make military women feel, you know, more confident when they're wearing these uniforms every single day. So when Air Force officers have a problem, I feel like they can find these solutions so clearly and then they have such great skills to execute it and to get it done and have the resiliency to follow through it correlates perfectly to the business world. Again, it's more time consuming, but also it allows you that freedom to kind of see like your options also. Like you don't just have to do 20 years. You you don't, you know, you can if that's what you would love to do. But then when you get out, you're still going to be young. So it's like, why don't you have the skill working on it now and kind of fostering that within yourself? So I fully, fully believe that they should. Yeah. I mean, you're spot on with the idea that the Air Force officer has this incredible skill set. They have this ability to sift through the noise, to ignore the chaff, and focus in and hone in on the solution. And hopefully we've trained them well enough that they can make the decision and proceed with violence of action, right? Absolutely. But what they are lacking is a knowledge of how the private business world, the commercial sector, works. Yes. And I'm experiencing that right now in that I've left active duty, still in the reserve, but pursuing careers in e-commerce and online coaching and those kinds of things. And it's a steep learning curve for me to try and understand how all of that works. Had I started years ago while I was still on active duty, I'd be all the better for it. And Not only would I have the knowledge of all those things, but I would have the experience of having solved those problems outside of the Air Force context. And then on top of that, everything that I have learned so far about the private business world, the rapid innovation, the continuous process improvement, the emotional intelligence, and those things that they care so much about, I could bring that back into the Air Force and be a better Air Force officer because of it. And I just, I wish that we were better at helping, again, it's a mentorship thing, helping Air Force officers to see the opportunities that are before them outside of the military while they're still in the military. Right. The Air Force is very supportive when it comes to showing you that you can be whatever you want and you can perform this excellent level. But it's really the member's responsibility to really go after those resources and to see and to apply themselves outside of Um, their service as well to be able to learn and grow. Because I think a lot of people are like, oh, I got my degree. You know what I mean? I'm good to go. I'll get my master's. And like, that's what it is. And it's just school. But it's like, no, like you need that real world experience too Mm -hmm. to become a better person also and to grow as a person. So yeah, see, you're hitting it on the head right there. The Air Force is really good at helping you progress academically to progressing your knowledge on a topic through the Air Force lens. What the Air Force is not good at Even with things like education with industry, that's a good attempt at it, but there is nothing that compares with starting your own business and identifying the pain and the passion points of your potential customer, driving at a solution, sifting through the regulations, the laws that govern business activities, understanding how to create a brand promise and market that and share that vision with the potential customer to the point where they trust you enough to give you their money. Mm-hmm. In the Air Force, we don't deal with money. You're right. Mm-hmm. Right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you know, for us, money affects everything that we do in the Air Force for sure, but we're not a revenue generating organization. And so the bottom line for us is not money. The bottom line is the success or failure of a particular mission. Exactly. Gosh, yeah. I think the second I started to realize how important it is to make money and to like really see myself as someone who needs to generate that type of money was when I decided to get out. So I'm separating in June, doing my four years and I'm getting out. Out completely? Or are you going to still be in the reserve? Have you considered that option? 
I have definitely considered it, but with what I want to do, I really want to be like a free spirit traveling the world. I don't want to be tied to anything. So, um, I really want to be, it's something I I think I'm really done. And, but the thing is I didn't come up with that decision. Like right away. I was like, what the heck, how am I going to make money? Like, how am I going to do this? And once I started to get out, here's the thing. It's not that the air force doesn't tell us, but they'll tell us at the end. Do you know what I mean? Like when you're about to get out, (laughs) they're like, oh, here's like a million things you need to do before you get out. Like, but it's like, whoa, like, I think I wish I had like years to prepare for this or to start researching this. and So I'm doing the skill bridge program. So I think we should definitely get into that. Yeah, it's amazing. And then I did the boots to business class. They have something like that out there. And then they have, um, I mean, the SBA, all those things. There's so many resources for veterans, but they don't tell you until the end. And I'm just like, oh man, like, so I'm in that process right now where I'm literally just reading. I feel like I'm in a master's program because of everything you have to learn about business before you can really make it profitable and successful and legal and all the things. Yeah. So I think that's really what it is. It's just having those conversations currently, but, you know, throughout the process of serving, that's what it is. Yeah. And all that's such an important point. It's not that these resources don't exist. It's not that the Air Force doesn't want you to be an entrepreneur and get practical experience outside of the Air Force. It's just that it's not set up the way to really help people like you and me be successful. Sure, there are things like Dodds Gilbridge and Boots to Business and even TAP, Transition Assistance Program. It is a good program. It just, like you said, it comes too late. We need to be teaching these kinds of things in commissioning, yeah. uh, in the commissioning programs. Right, right. The Air Force officer, even before they become one, needs to be thinking about this through their entire Air Force career for the very reasons that we've already described so that they can take what they learn in the Air Force, apply it to the business world, take what they learn from the business world, apply it into the Air Force. But then on top of all of that, leave themselves with the option of pursuing something else other than the Air Force. And it's not that we want talented people to leave the Air Force. Mm -mm. No, but we want people to feel like they're not stuck in the Air Force. We want people to choose to stay in the Air Force because they love what they do, but the option is available to them at any point to leave. And this is especially going to become true as the high three retirement program goes away, the pension plan, and everybody from this point forward is in the blended retirement system where you can take the money that you got and go do something else. Exactly. Exactly. Everybody thinks that the Air Force is a long-term commitment and that the Air Force is also committed to you for the long term. That's not true. There will come a time, and we're going through it right now, where the Air Force could very easily just say, thank you for your service. We don't need you anymore. Then you're caught flat-footed, unable to take the next step because you haven't prepared well enough, because the Air Force didn't prepare you well enough. But it's not the Air Force's job. It is your job. Exactly. It is. It is. But people understand that it's not the Air Force's job, but it should be more like maybe a little more celebrated. Maybe. I mean, it should be more of like, um, because usually you're seeing like, you know, veteran owned businesses or whatever. And so it usually has this connotation of like, okay, they're done. And then they, they made right. something. Now they're in this like group with like veterans that start businesses. But it's like, we need kind of that vibe of active duty people who have that drive to be doing that type of exploration. And it should be more celebrated, I think. So good. Haley, this has been fantastic. And there's so much more that we could really dig into there, but we'll just have to have you come back, especially once you get torch off the ground and you know, you're know you making all your millions and changing the lives of all of these women in the military, first responders, and also you know in the dance world. I see there's an opportunity there for you as well. Yes. I am a dancer also, by the way. Just Are you, wanna Colin? Throw, okay. I am. Okay, I think the fans want to dance off. I think that's what we have to do next. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I tell you what. You come up with the choreography, send it to me, okay. and I will make a fool of myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it for you. Okay, just get ready for the choreo. <laughs> I really, really appreciate your experience, your willingness to come on and share, your willingness to take a risk 
and go do something else. Yes, thank you so much, Haley, for the time that you have spent in the Air Force, for the sacrifice, the blood, sweat, and tears that you have given. But I could not be more excited for you and what is going to come next. And please be a mentor. Not that you weren't going to do it already, but here's the perfect opportunity for you to be an example to not just women, not just those of other races, not just Air Force officers, but like everyone of what is possible if you will take the opportunity to learn, to grow, to take a risk and create something that is all your own. I am so excited to see you. I hate saying this, to see you on the outside, just absolutely crushing it. Colin, I'm telling you right now, that means more than you can imagine. And I'm sure as a fellow entrepreneur, you understand there's highs and lows and it's not as stable as the military. It's never as stable, but really going after, and I have a saying, it's seek what sets your soul on fire. So again, tying into torch and everything. I really believe in like going after what excites you and what makes you happy as a person. It's not all about stability. It's about taking that risk and to go after it. You learn so much about yourself and For anyone out there listening, I'm seriously always here to talk. I absolutely love when people reach out to me like, how did you do this? Or how can we do this? Or can you talk to me? Like, why are you also fired up all the time? I'm like, well, because I'm (laughs) I'm excited with what I'm doing, what I'm pursuing. It's not an easy path, but it's something that I'm very thankful for that I have, you know, the drive to go for it. And I'm very thankful for the Air Force for giving me that opportunity and to be on my feet right now to explore those options. So I'm very thankful. And Colin, thank you for bringing me on here to have this incredible experience. And we'll be friends. We'll be making TikToks together. It's all good. We'll we'll be uh, sending out that choreo for anybody else that wants to learn it. Okay. (laughs) So thank you, Haley, for leaving it open for people to get in contact with you. You're obviously not going to be in the Air Force beyond June. So we're not going to use an Air Force address. How would you like people to get in touch with you if they want to learn a little bit about maybe being a gold bar recruiter or force support officer, section commander. Maybe they want to be an NFL cheerleader. How should they get in touch with you? Absolutely. You guys can hit me up on Instagram. I'm super responsive at I am underscore Haley Murray. All right. And if they want to learn a little bit more about this company that you're launching, Torch, right? Heck yeah. Or should they go to learn about that too? Sure. So we have an Instagram as well, Torch underscore by Haley Murray, or you can go to our website, torchbyhaleymurray.com. Awesome. Haley, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. So excited for all that you're going to accomplish here in the near future and in the long term. It's going to be awesome to see your growth and development. Thank you. You as well, Colin. I know this podcast is going to be a freaking rock star. So thank you for bringing us all together and have these discussions. It's so important. Thank you. All right, Reed, there's a couple of things that I feel like we need to pull out of this interview. First of all, though, Haley is a great speaker, great personality, great presence. She's been a huge compliment to the Air Force, grateful for her service and wish her all the best as she moves on to running her business and whatever else the future has in store for her. So where I want to go first from the interview is, and I know we already discussed this in depth in the interview itself, but I want to come back to this idea of barriers to entry, having mentors that help you to find your path and want to get your take on it, Reed, because clearly like what we said in the interview is that the Air Force picked her for the gold bar recruiting opportunity because she is the quintessential not Air Force demographic, right? She's a woman, she's black, she has a math degree. There are all these things that the Air Force really loves and they're trying to get more of. And so they sent her out to try and get more people who look and think and speak like her, as opposed to people that look like and speak like and think like you and me, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is, I don't have any easy solutions to this hard problem. You know, it's really gave me a lot to think about. And when we think about too, how she got in, how she even thought about the Air Force, even that had a lot of external factors that almost no one else has to a large degree. You know, she had a grandmother who was a retired senior NCO out of the Air Force. She has a mother who was a mathematician scientist at NASA. Not everybody has those things. And Mm -hmm the amount of luck and timing that went into her finding the Air Force, 
you can't necessarily replicate that. I don't know that you could right. deliberately create a system where those types of things would occur. And, and so this is just a wicked hard problem. Yeah, I agree with you. There's certainly a great amount of luck and timing that went into that. But I think what the Air Force is trying to do by putting people like her out there in the public eye is getting more eyeballs on people like her as opposed to people like you and me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that makes sense. They're just trying to show what's possible. Clearly, not every black woman mathematician is going to join the Air Force because they see her out at a recruiting event or even they see her performing at a NFL football game and uh, she gets highlighted by such and such spot that says, oh, by the way, she's also an Air Force officer and you can be one too. I don't know that that's going to lead to a huge increase in the recruitment of the non-white male demographic. But you can see that the Air Force cares enough to try to make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. You and I have talked about how important diversity is in so many venues already. And yeah, couldn't agree more. The intellectual diversity that comes with and accompanies the diversity from all of the amazing places and people that we have in this country are just, they're necessary. And you and I have experienced that in our personal lives on the day-to-day -day on the mission. Yeah. So, you know, something else that I wanted to bring up, Colin, that kind of stems directly from Haley's experience is Yes, luck and timing was a really important and critical aspect of her journey to find the Air Force and to find her role in it. But she is still an agent with the opportunity to choose. Mm -hmm. And I think I want to emphasize that point again. We've brought that up multiple times and the idea of being make your own luck. I found that that was really compelling in her story. And I wanted to use one example of how she did not put in for or choose for support. Yet it was given to her. Yep. It was given to her and she has decided to kind of make it her own. And that is the kind of attitude and outlook that will drive behaviors that will lead you to success in whatever field you're looking at or whatever you're given. We all know people who put in for certain jobs in the ROTC job drop and got something not on their list because we hear about it all the time. Yeah. And they let us know. And I think her ability to take action to be her own agent and to make her own luck is going to lead her to success in whatever she chooses. Yeah. That is such an essential trait for us, despite maybe what may appear as a storied career history, there is always some element of, and then I put my head down and got to work, even though it kind of sucked. Yeah. And here I am. Yeah. While you're saying this, though, I had this other thought. We've talked about luck and timing, making our own luck. We've had this discussion before, but something that I don't think that we've necessarily talked about that I think is useful here is, yes, sometimes we have the ability to make our own luck, but maybe more often we make our own barriers. We make our own barriers to entry yeah. to the thing that we want. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. For example, you get the AFSC that you don't want. Maybe you end up as a force support officer and you're really not happy about that. And instead of putting your head down and finding ways to succeed within that career field, you go around to everybody that you know and you gripe about it and you tell everyone, hey, this is not what I wanted. I was supposed to be a pilot for the Air Force. I was supposed to be out there flying the F-35. And yet here I am pushing papers and taking care of, you know, getting retirees their new ID cards. And can you imagine the type of environment that you're creating for yourself and for yeah. others by mm -hmm. doing that? Yeah, I think that's a really good insight. Think about the barriers to your own success you're creating. Yeah. When it comes time for someone to evaluate you and you're sowing seeds of discord and disharmony, that's not improving the unit. No, it's not. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to avoid. And I think that's a really good point, Colin. You can kind of create your own barriers to entry. I've seen that and felt that in my own experience. We've talked about my OTS experience. Yeah. I was ready to punch I was looking for work. I was so upset and I decided to put my head down and it was a very successful experience for me that has still changed my Air Force career. I remember reading on an online forum, and I believe I shared this with you, Colin, about someone who had a similar experience in things not going the way they wanted, but they decided to put their head down and here they find themselves in 06 
going, wow, that was a really pivotal moment in my career where I decided to take action and work hard and look where it's led me. Now, I'm not saying that if you decide to endure and grin and bear it, that everything's going to turn out roses. Yeah. But I do think the attitude required, the perspective, the outlook in order to take that kind of action will lead you to success in whatever you choose to do. Yeah. I mean, I'm a great example of someone who created my own barriers. I've shared before that as a result of my field training experience as a cadet, I stopped taking ROTC seriously. I stopped preparing myself for my entrance into active duty. And when I arrived, I was not ready. And it was really hard for me for a number of years there because I did not understand my role in the Air Force as an officer. I was not prepared because I had created these barriers to my own success. Had I done differently, had I recognized that maybe that FTO is trying to teach me something that could be useful later on, I could have done much better. I'm not saying that it would have led to my ultimate desire of the Air Force of being an Elmstead scholar. I'm sure that it probably wouldn't have. But I think I would have enjoyed my first four years on active duty much more than I did. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point. Very interesting. So, Colin, I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of uh, raise a point of order, if I may, with some things that, <laughs> okay. that you and Haley were pretty excited about. So, in all fairness, this is definitely because, so Colin, we're recording this on Christmas Adam. So, two days before Christmas, not Christmas Eve, Christmas Adam. I love that you call it Christmas Adam. I can, don't. Can we make this a thing out my kid, there in the My world? kids brought it up today. They're thrilled about Christmas. We're excited too, but not nearly as much as my nine-year-old. Anyway, it's the 23rd of December. Yes, it is. For those of us who celebrate this holiday. And I have the lens at the end of the calendar year of trying to simplify, to declutter, to kind of get down to the essentials. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening to you and Haley talk about how every airman needs to have a side hustle. And okay. I, I said this out loud. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, we don't. Hear me out. I think we have more in common on this than maybe that statement would lead us to believe. But as much as airmen have going on, you know, families, school, hobbies, the work, the mission, Colin, we tell them they've got to read all the time. They've got to be in improving themselves. Listen to every single one of our episodes. Go watch our YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. With everything that we are talking about, I would certainly have the sense of almost the inability to do it all. Fitness. I mean, the list goes on, right? Of the things we just keep hammering. Yeah. And so I'm sitting here without a side hustle, listening to you guys say, everybody's got to have a side hustle. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, we don't. We need to simplify. And so what I would like to, you know, raise and, and put as a point of order, I think everybody needs to be pursuing excellence. Okay. And whatever it is that they're trying to do. And I think the lens you and Haley have at this moment is definitely focused on that entrepreneurship, that finding the next thing. Yeah. And in that way, you are pursuing excellence. I think that's totally fair. So, but yeah, I just a little point of order. I don't think every airman needs to have a side hustle. What say you? Well, my point of order to your point of order, Reed, is that you do have a side hustle. You're on this podcast hustling. I mean... But I feel this is an extension of my role as an officer to provide mentorship. So, eh, okay, <laughs> I guess. And, you know, and to be fair, I think when other people, you know, in my same station look at me, they would see this as a side hustle. Okay, fine. And you made me do this. I'll just point that out. <laughs> yeah, blame me. That's fine. I'll own it. No, but I hear what you're saying. When the Air Force is already asking for its pound of flesh, why should we give it to? Yeah. I understand what you're saying. I hear it. But where you have your lens of wanting to simplify, the place that I am coming from, especially as a traditional reservist where the Air Force is not my full-time gig, and yet I'm still an officer and I bear the same responsibility that you do in developing future officers, I need to give myself options because... At any point, the full-time employment may be gone, right? And so, and the actual reality there, Reed, is that the same could happen with the Air Force. Yes. And you've talked about this before, too, that at any point, the Air Force could say, thank you, but we don't need you anymore. Yes. And so, 
if you find yourself in that situation where you don't have options, what are you going to do? Yeah. And that's my point is that the Air Force gives us this great skill set of being a leader of managing complex processes and people and all of these other things that are valuable in the private business world, in running your own business, in things that are not the Air Force that you can utilize on behalf of the Air Force. But we all know that at some point, we're going to be out of the Air Force for some reason or another. So why not give yourself options and be prepared for it? Yeah. And yes, we've even talked recently how I mentioned this. We need to be thinking about the afterlife whenever that happens, and we need to start thinking about it sooner. And I still agree with that. I think the main difference you and I have is where is the line on how much the Air Force owes you in that regard? Yeah. You know, I'm sitting here in a leadership position in a resource constrained environment thinking about how to keep the lights on. I don't have time to try and find a retiring senior NCO, an amazing gig on the outside. Because I'm just trying to keep the lights on for the people that are still here. Yeah. And we've talked about this, you know, maybe briefly, but this gets to a, a really challenging part of being a leader. And that's how do you help everyone achieve their individual objectives when sometimes those objectives are outside of the Air Force? You know, this got back to some of those episodes where you talked about separating and how it feels like dying and how people are afraid to say, I'm out because the Air Force will stop developing them. Mm -hmm. And we've bemoaned that fact. And it is a wicked hard problem. And, you know, case in point, hypothetical scenario, you've got to send someone to training and that person is going to come back and train your unit. We call these train the trainer. Yeah. So you send someone to get like that next level of experience so that they can come and help other people in the organization. Yep. It's way cheaper than sending, you know, 20 people to training. You send one person to extra training they can train everybody else. All right, so that's the basic idea. Well, you've got two people. And let's say that the primary person that you should send on paper, you know, by math, your primary person in this field is getting out in a year. And then your deputy, they are not getting out. And you can only send one. You know, it is not unreasonable to say, well, I'm going to send the person that's going to stay in the Air Force a little bit longer because I might get some more cycles out of them in the training. Yeah. Right. That's not an unreasonable thing to say. Yeah. Your responsibility is toward the Air Force, the mission, and making sure that people have what they need to accomplish that mission. Yeah. And yet you have a responsibility to that separating member. And I still feel that way. Yeah. And so, you know, if the answer for me is to be reputable, repeatable, and transparent. And honestly, I'd bring them both in and tell them, this is my dilemma. This is what I'm feeling. So hypothetical scenario, right? Let's say that you've got this exact situation we've just laid out. Your primary should be going, but they're separating in a year. And so you're concerned that you may not get the return on investment for your limited TDY dollars. Your deputy is going to stay in. They've made that clear. And you're thinking, I can get more cycles out of this person. Well, hypothetically, let's say that this training is actually going to be helpful to the person separating when they leave. They're going to be able to do this thing outside of the Air Force. Okay. I think you still send that person. You still send your primary. Why? It helps them in their post-Air Force career achieve their intent. It helps the Air Force for the year that you've got them. And on paper, they're the number one. Yeah. I think you can justify that. And I think that's a way you can, you know, again, in this wildly hypothetical situation, you can knock out two birds with one stone there. But it's hard. This is the kind of stuff that we don't train to. We don't talk about. And I think this is exactly the kind of thing that makes leadership hard. Yeah. And yeah, this one, this is a tough problem. Tough problem. Yeah, I agree with you that the Air Force doesn't owe us those options, but the Air Force should not prevent us from creating those options for yeah. ourselves. Yeah. And we get into this in the interview itself that... The Air Force tells you too late about what your potential options could be, such as going to TAP or the Transition Assistance Program or signing up for things like Dodd Skills Bridge or Boots to Business. The Air Force doesn't tell you about those things. They don't come out and proactively advertise 
those opportunities to you. People don't find out about them until it's really too late for you to effectively do anything about it in preparation for your exit from the Air Force. But more important to me, your ability to use those skills from starting your own business or working in the private business world on behalf of the Air Force. It's too late. Yeah. And this is where you and I, this is our point of departure, right? We both agree that there needs to be some level of Air Force involvement in helping you be successful as an individual. Yeah. It's the degree to which, where do we draw that line, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, the Air Force has got a whole heck of a lot to do. And one of those is, you know, the mission of securing airspace to allow freedom of maneuver and decision space for our national leaders. And so that's kind of where I start. Yeah. But again, that's my lens. And you're coming at this from the traditional reservist perspective, from the you know, looking for that next gig perspective and and having separated twice, you know, so you're more intimately familiar with this. And it, yeah, this is a tough, a tough problem. And I honestly, I think it's a good problem to have. How do we help people achieve their ultimate objectives? That's what we're talking about. I would much prefer it be that than, you know, how do we accomplish the mission? Because we can't, I guess is, is what I'm getting at. Well, that is the ultimate purpose of the Air Force is to accomplish the mission. And if we are able to develop people along the way, we should. And this is one way that people can be developed is in giving themselves options, additional experience outside of the Air Force so that they can use it on behalf of the Air Force. Yeah. I'm not saying that I want people to go have a side hustle so that they can get out of the Air Force sooner. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm saying that there are experiences and skills and knowledge to be gained outside of the Air Force that is going to help the Air Force better accomplish the mission. That's my thought. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as we're talking through this, this kind of, it's almost like a juxtaposition or a, a contradiction where the things that are best for the individual are not necessarily best for the group. Right. In the same way that, you know, in economics, individual decisions to spend or save are different. You know, the best thing for an individual with respect to spending or saving is different than what is best for the economy writ large. Right. So it may be best for you as an individual to save your money, mm -hmm. yet the economy is begging for people to consume. Right. I, I'm kind of feeling that vibe right now. So it's best for you as an individual to figure out what that post Air Force life is, how to apply those skills that you're getting outside of the Air Force, and likewise, those skills you're getting outside the Air Force in. But it's best for the Air Force to focus solely on a mission accomplishment because they can't. I'm just getting that vibe of that very interesting collective versus individual problem. Yeah, I agree with you. And I wish that we had more to say on how to solve that problem rather than just pointing at the big, hairy problem that... Oh, that Colin, <laughs> if we could solve this problem, you and I would not need to be employed by the federal government in any form. Instead, we'd be running it. it yeah, it would be... <laughs> yeah. I mean, use that economics example as the quintessential example. If we could solve that problem, we could write our own ticket. We could buy Billionaire's right. Row there in Manhattan because we would own it. But yeah, we're not there. <laughs> Maybe somebody out there has a solution for us and they can send it to us, right? You know, get in touch with us, Air Force Officer Podcast at gmail.com. We'll get on here and let you make your pitch to the Air Force and uh, give you full credit for your solution to the Air Force's problems. Yeah. Hey, Colin, <laughs> thanks so much for bringing on Haley McLean Hill. What a fantastic interview. I am definitely inspired. I did find myself thinking, what have I done with my life <laughs> to some degree? But you know You're what? You're not an NFL cheerleader. <laughs> I know. I mean, come on. But no, for real. Love to see you in a kick line. Hey, I have great legs, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, really appreciate Haley coming on. That was a fantastic interview. Again, really inspiring. And I keep coming back to it, man. She made her own luck. Yeah, she really did. And she's going to be successful in whatever she chooses to do. Really excited to have her on. Anything else before we wrap up this week, Colin? Just want to say thanks again to Haley. Wish you all the best. And thanks to the audience for tuning into this week's episode of Commissioner. Commission Edit.